archaeologists found these artifacts in Illinois and these are Phoenician artifacts uh, the archaeologists say that they're African but no these are Phoenician the story that they made was Greeks decided one day to just take some Africans from Africa and go to America during the time of Alexander go to America and leave these artifacts here and then go back that does not make sense why would Greeks just say you know what let's take some Africans bring them across the Atlantic go to America not only go to America but walk all the way to Illinois make some coins leave them there and then go back to Greece it doesn't make sense you gotta really think critically okay these people been here okay this is what we're looking at we're looking at black people in America these are Phoenicians Phoenicians the great travelers the people who traveled the world they originated here in America so right here you see a Phoenician woman right um, when you look at the script on her hair you see the first thing you say is oh that's paleo hebrew this is hebrew but this is the hebrew that was spoken by moab spoken by ammon spoken by esau and spoken by the canaanites okay understand that the phoenicians were a mixed group of people these were key shemitic people key shemitic means they were mixed with ham and shum okay the Phoenicians were mixed mixtures of Canaanites and Moabites and Ammonites and some Edomites because Esau, we know through the scriptures that Esau took Canaanite wives, right? So that's what the Phoenicians are. They're mixtures of these people. So you're looking at their, their language, right? But don't get them confused with Israelites because these are not Israelites. Look at this. Okay, look at this artifact right here. You know that this is obviously a Negro, right? You could look at his hair, you could look at his nose, you could look at his lips. You could just tell that's absolutely 100% a Negro. But it's not an Israelite because Israelites grew their beards. They did not get tattoos. Um, they didn't shave cleanly. They didn't do any of that you see in this picture. Look. But look closely. What do you see here? You see two things at the bottom of this artifact. You see number one. Um, a horse <laughs> and you also see Greek letters okay now the thing about this is you'll see a lot of Greek letters on it understand that Greek is a language that originated from the Phoenicians and the Phoenicians originated from the Americas so understand that Greek in general comes from the Americas that's a whole different topic but when we see the horse understand what you're really dealing with you're dealing with the actual animals that lived in the Americas before Columbus. They'll tell you that all horses in America came from the East. I'm telling you, horses lived in America thousands of years before Columbus. Always, okay? And don't say that Greeks brought these people over here from Africa. That does not make any sense. Here's another one. You can tell that this is Negro. Without a shadow of a doubt, but it's not Israelite because he has all the tattooing and scars on his face. As you can see, more script. Here we go again. Absolute Negro, right? If I that's hard to see, but that's actually yeah, Greek script again. This is found in Illinois. Bald. You can still tell us a Negro. You can also tell it's not an Israelite because Israelites never shaved their heads bald, never clean shaved their faces at all. Here's another one. You can finally see that that Greek, that Greek Phoenician on the side, right? That's where it originated from, the Americas. Look at this. Obvious Negro, though. Obvious Negro. This is found right here. You see that it kind of look, it kind of looks old Mechish kind of look old mechish but look at the helmet this is the same kind of helmet that the gladiators of greece wore and this is found in illinois these were the sailors these were the travelers from beyond remember when the phoenicians went into europe they named the the they named spain iberia they called it iberia it means land of the hebrews because they were the people from beyond from the other side that's what hebrew means so 
And you see the Moors, the Moors are travelers. These Moors are descended from Phoenicians, Moab, Esau, mixed with Canaan. That's what we got to understand. So here we are again. We see another Negro, right? Uh, you, you can 100% tell that's a Negro, right? Again, not Israelite. Because Israelites never shave their head. They never shave their beard off. Again, another one. You can see the you can see like a cross type thing on this necklace. Look at that. And that uh, that later carried on in, into Greece as well. Look at this hair, very very curly, right? Negro. He has a strange type of hat on. And you you still know he's negro, right? You can still tell he's very negroid, right? Oh, and look at that. Look at that. Look at that. You see a ship right there, don't you? And on the ship, we notice a sail. The reason why the ship is so significant is because these Phoenicians traveled the sea. As you can see here, you have another one. Obvious Negroid. And what do you see at the top? You can see a feather, right? We know that the people of the Americas always wore feathers, right? That's that's what they're renowned for, right? Here we see it again. Another one. Very Negroid. Detailed hair. Strange hat. All that. More script on the side. As you can see, like, his facial structure. You can tell that's Canaanite. You can see the same phenotype with a lot of the uh, Asians and all of that. When you go into world history, you'll find out that Asians, East Asians, like Chinese in them, you'll find out that they are actually Hamitic mixed with Japhetic, okay? And a lot of the Chinese are descended from Canaanites as well as Japhetites. But that's a whole nother story. But you look at the hair, you can tell that's Negro. And this is the script that they spoke. You can see that this, you'll say, oh, that's Hebrew. But it's not the same kind of Hebrew that the Israelites spoke. This is the Hebrew that the, the Edomites and the Ishmaelites and the Moabites and the Canaanites spoke. Okay. So, yeah, that's basically what it is. The mainstream curriculum of, of like the world, they would have you believe that Aboriginal Americans did not have any way to access the sea. They did not have ships, they did not have boats, they did not have sails, they did not have any of that. If you're one of those uneducated buffoons who believe that nonsense, then you, my friend, are deceived because every single Native American tribe who lived by the sea knew how to access and how to run the sea, okay? Not only the Tiresians and the Zidonians, not only the Phoenicians, but also the Israelites, we knew how to run the sea. We were the owners, basically. Understand how Solomon knew about the trade winds. He wrote about the trade winds in his books, right? He said, the north wind comes south and it goes north again. Uh, school tells you that Christopher Columbus was the first person to uh, discover the trade winds. But no, it was Solomon. And you don't really discover the trade winds in the small sea like the Mediterranean. You have to get into the ocean, the actual ocean, to know about trade winds. And that is just another little point of why I think, why I believe firmly Solomon lived in the Americas and not no Middle East. Because if Solomon lived in the Middle East, there's no way he could know about trade winds like that because they don't really... The currents of the Mediterranean don't just go north and south and north again like that. It doesn't really work like that. Most of them go, most of them just go west. Oh, I got the book from Babylon and Timbuktu. Now, although a lot of this information in here is mainstream, Smithsonian type, historian type, school type knowledge that are actually hijacks, it still has a lot of gems in it. For example, when we're talking about chapter three, when we're talking about Afro-Asian culture goes to Europe, let us understand what we're really talking about, right? For example, we're talking about this. The greatest cultural and commercial cities of the black Canaanites were Tyre and Sidon, sometimes written as Zidon. 
This city gets its name from Sidon, the firstborn son of Canaan. The first thing you need to know is that the Phoenicians were never called Phoenicians until they came into contact with the Dorians, Pelasgians, and Marcinians, okay? Collectively, who we call today the Greeks. The Greeks called them Phoenicians. Before they were called Phoenicians, they were called Zidonians or Tyrians, aka Canaanites, who eventually mixed themselves with Ammon, Moab, Esau, Ishmael, etc. The Phoenicians spoke a Hamitic Shemitic, basically a key Shemitic language, so closely allied to the Hebrew that Phoenician and Hebrew, though different dialects, may practically be regarded as the same language. See, Israelites were already told beforehand not to mix with the Canaanites, so most Israelites refused to even marry a Canaanite, but the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Ishmaelites, the Edomites, they, they weren't given that instruction. So of course, since they could speak the same language as the Canaanites, of course they were mixing, of course they were. Then it goes on to say the wealth of Phoenicia or Carthage, hold up. So Carthage is right here, okay? Like right in this region, right here. And Phoenicia is right there. Phoenicia, Greek name, never ever mentioned in the Old Testament at all. The, the name Phoenicia, not in the Bible, okay? When the Tyrians and the Zidonians traveled across the Atlantic and went to Africa, they made major port cities along the region, around, around right here, what we call today Gaza, Joppa, places right there, which is not really the real Gaza or Joppa, but that's where they settled, right? Their knowledge of navigation allowed them to reach the British Isles and the Arctic Ocean. So we know they were dealing with the British Isles and the Arctic Ocean. Now, scholars will tell you there were two ways the Phoenicians got to the Arctic Ocean. They A, sailed straight through the Mediterranean and they B, took ports into the Red Sea and went all the way around Africa and then got into it. Historians also say that the Phoenicians traveled straight through Asia as well. It is very possible because the Phoenicians, they were all over the place. We got artifacts of Phoenicians all around here. We got artifacts of Phoenicians around here in this area and right here. So yeah, it's possible. But understand where they really came from. The real Tyree, the real Zidon on the coast of the real Great Sea. Moving eastward, these people mixed in with Ammon, Moab, Esau, Ishmael, etc. You know, that's why we have these artifacts around this region in Illinois, right? They continue to go east. They sailed off into the Atlantic, boom. And that's why we have something called the Iberian Peninsula. It really wasn't hard for these Phoenicians to just travel straight from the Americas into the Atlantic and make it to Spain because that's what really happened. Another word for Spain and Portugal together is basically the Iberian Peninsula. Now, Iberia literally means land of the Hebrews, land of Eber, right? Uh, the reason it's called the land of the Hebrews or Iberia is because what does Hebrew mean? It means people from the other side. People from the other side of what? The other side of the Atlantic. This is what we're dealing with. Now, this particular map, you will see a lot of my videos. This map in particular is a Mercator map made in the 1500s during the time when the Americas in general were just starting to be colonized but you see how it's so almost accurate it's very very accurate considering that America is just now getting to be colonized well that's because Europeans Caucasian Europeans did not uh, have knowledge of this land by themselves they also sided with Moors who've always been dealing with the Americas another question is why are there so many ships in the Pacific Ocean Europeans Caucasian Europeans never really went in the Pacific during the 1500s they it was just a basic it was just a basic triangle trade Europeans came from Spain 
went to South America, went right here, going back. That's what the triangle was. I don't understand why there's so many ships right here. See, the artist, the cartographer of this map, put everything right here for a reason. Who do these ships belong to? Could they belong to the real Tiresians and the real Zidonians? And could they be sailing this way? Are these the Moors? Because how do they have so much knowledge of the ex almost exact shape of the Americas in the 1500s? This is just a question, a big question that blows my mind. In the book, Africans and Native Americans by Jack D. Forbes, we get a lot of information about um, how the certain Native American tribes were experts when it came to the sea. Let's start reading, shall we? The Americans of the Caribbean region were outstanding navigators and seamen. So we're talking about Native Americans of the Caribbean region, of course, but it wasn't just of the Caribbean region, right? All over the coast of America, we had great ships, great boats, canoes, sails, all of that, all of that. But it's just specifically talking about the Caribbean region. Why? Because this is really what's documented. Because this is all talking about what was going on during the time of Columbus. And Columbus only dealt with the Caribbean. He wasn't dealing with the East Coast, the West Coast, and all the other stuff, right? He was only dealing with the Caribbean. So that's the only part that's documented. But let's look. It says, The Americans of the Caribbean region were outstanding navigators and seamen, as noted by the Spaniards and other Europeans. Christopher Columbus was impressed everywhere by their skill. He noted, for example, that their boats, barbacoes, or barquillos, which they all call canoas, were excellently made from a single tree, were very large and long, carrying sometimes 40 or 45 men, two or more cadeaux, perhaps a man's breadth in width. The American boats were unsinkable, and if in a storm they happened to capsize, the sailors simply turned them back over while swimming in the sea, bailing them out with the guards carried for that purpose. Andreas Bernaldez recorded from Columbus that the Americans navigated with their canoas with exceptional agility and speed, with 60 to 80 men in them, each with an oar, and they went by the sea 150 leagues or more. They were masters of the sea. So basically, these Europeans are bragging about these American sailors. They're saying they're masters of the sea. They have great speed and agility. Their boats are unsinkable. What are they saying? They're saying that their ships, the way they sail the sea, is better than the way the Europeans sail the sea. They're jealous because guess what? The biggest thing that the Europeans were worried about when they were coming to the Americas is their ship sinking. Because a lot of the times the European ships did sink. Okay, we see a lot of ship remains under the Atlantic Ocean. They're jealous. A canoe was later discovered in Jamaica that was 96 feet long, 8 feet broad, and made from a single tree. Columbus found that the Lokio people of the Bahamas were not only very equated with Cuba, one and a half days away via canoe, but also knew that from Cuba it was 10 days journey to the mainland. Doubtless Mexico or South America since Florida would have been closer than that. He also saw a boat which was 95 palms away and 150 persons could be contained and navigate. Others were seen which were of great workmanship being expertly carved. A canoe was also seen being navigated successfully by one man in the high winds and rough sea. Columbus captured Caribs in the Antios, such as Guadalupe, from whom he learned of the South American mainland, but also learned of the mainland from Americans living on St. Crooks in Barinquian, Puerto Rico. Oh, by the way, Barinquian is a Hebrew word. It means it comes from the Hebrew word Barak, which means to bless. Shalom wa Baraka Mishpaka. I remember I used to say that all the time. Okay, anyway. Americans who were taken into Europe drew maps there which showed Haiti, Cuba, and the Bahamas. 
So hold up, hold up, hold up. Not only was these Indians good with the sea, but they also knew how to make maps. Oh, uh, that's some stuff they don't want to tell y'all. They want they want you to believe that the Americans were stupid, dirty animals who walked around swinging from trees and stuff. Same like they want you to think about Africa. Same like they want you to think about everywhere where there was black people, right? They were just stupid, dirty animals. Not true. Let's continue to read. Freaking forgot what I was at. The people of the Caribbean were Assyrian exiles. The Assyrians, they exiled people into the sea. Okay, so when we're dealing with the map, Assyria being on the east coast of the Americas, they exiled the people into the sea. And they went to islands. Sometimes they went all the way to Africa. And that's how we got the Bantu expansion. But that's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother story. But yeah. <clears throat> Let's continue. Even more significant for our purposes is the fact that when Spaniards reached Yucatan in 1517, they saw 10 large canoes called Paraguas full of Indians from the town approaching us with oars and sails. What? Oars and what? Oars and sails. So you're telling me not only did these Native Americans have huge canoes that did not sink and were fast and agile in the water. But they also had sails, sails, like the Europeans had sails. So now you gotta think, you gotta think critically. You gotta think critically. Archaeologists found a stone tablet in Parabra, Brazil, which had Phoenician Hebrew inscriptions on it. And they translated it. Now I, I bid you, look. When they translate stuff, the translations are not always accurate and sometimes they purposely infiltrate hijacks into the translation to deceive you. But look, this is the translation. So look, this is what it actually says. It says, we are Sidonian Canaanites from the city of the mercantile king. We were cast up on this distant shore, a land of mountains. We sacrificed a youth to the celestial gods and goddesses in the 19th year of our mighty king Hiram and embarked from Ezion Gabar into the Red Sea. We journeyed with 10 ships and were at sea together for two years around Africa. See, that's, that's the fluke, that's a hijack. Africa is a new word. There's no way that these Phoenicians could have wrote the word Africa on that tablet. <laughs> And then they put in parentheses ham. No, there's no way. There's absolutely no way. Canaanites will call another continent ham. Because Canaanites come from ham too. And there's no way that they would have wrote Africa on a tablet because Africa was named after a Roman general way later. Scipio Africanus. Way later. That's the hijack. Dodge it. Then we were separated by the hand of Baal and were no longer with our companions. So we have come here, 12 men and three women into a new shirt. Am I the admiral, a man who would flee? Nay, may the celestial gods and goddesses favor us well. Let's look at this like it did take place in Africa. Okay, it said the first place they took off from was Ezion Gabar in the Middle Eastern model. Ezion Gabar is right there and it said they went through the Red Sea okay and they went all the way around so called Africa and then they made it to Paraba Brazil right there right now let me point out the one flaw that we're dealing with before the 17 and 1800s this was never called the Red Sea it was called Sinus Arabicus, which means the Arabian Sea. But when we look at maps that were made in the 1700s, the Gulf of California is actually called the Red Sea. And even today, you can ask anybody who lives in California. The Gulf of California, another name for it, is the Vermilion Sea. Vermilion is actually a shade of red. So understand what we're dealing with. In Hebrew, the name Red Sea is Yom Suf, 
The word yom means sea and the word suf means woolly. It's called the woolly sea because of the reeds that grow on the banks. The fluffy reeds that grow on the banks and they grow right here on the gulf, on the shore of the gulf. And not to mention the red algae that grows in the waters of here and here. That's why I call this the Red Sea East Wing and the Red Sea West Wing. Both of these Hebraically were considered to be the Red Sea, but this was considered to be the Egyptian Sea. Now the next place it said they went was around Africa. Now we know that Africa was not originally in the text instead of africa it could have said kush now if you follow me on instagram you would see my numerous drops that i've made about kush the true location of kush aka ethiopia aka africa okay now don't think of kush as one selective territory it's not kush is like kush is like america it's like the United States, right? Kush is like that. You know how the United States is mainly based in one area, but it has, you know, places of a different area. Like, the United States is mainly based in North America, right? But it also covers Hawaii, and it also covers Alaska, and it also covers Puerto Rico, right? All of that is United States territory. But think of it like this. When we're talking about Kush, it's just like that. Kush is mainly based in three areas. Mexico, South America, and Nigeria. No, not this modern day Ethiopia. The modern day Ethiopia is not Kush. You've been lied to about a lot of things. Nigeria, South America, and Mexico. That's Kush. And it has to do with topaz. Okay. In the book of Job, it says the land of Cush has a lot of topaz. Okay. But if we look in modern day Ethiopia, there is absolutely no topaz. It's only in these areas. So when it said they went around Africa, it should have said they went around Cush. And it's very possible for them to go around here all the way. And go in through and go in through the Drake Passage. Now the Drake Passage is the, the section of ocean that's in between Antarctica and South America. They go through the Drake Passage and around and around and then land right there. That's what really happened. That's what really happened, people. Now of course you can see the full drop of Kush. I explain where it's at on my Instagram page or you can just wait till I make a video on that I have no idea when I'm gonna make a video on that uh, the next video coming up should be part three of this uh, migration series but yeah just hold on, just hold on.